Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Welcome to the Culture Matters podcast. We are on episode number 72. And our guest today is Joe, or again, Joseph Amato. And uh, Joe, or Joseph, I can call him Joseph. In 1968, this is the introduction, and this guy goes back years and years. In 1969, Amato began teaching at the Southwest Minnesota State University, or SMSU, in Marshall, Minnesota, where he was a founder and chair of the history department. He taught a range of courses in European intellectual and cultural history with a particular interest in the Middle Ages, Renaissance, German, Italian and French histories and European rural life, as well as taught ethics and introductory social science courses. Amado has given countless lectures and talks on a variety of subjects in the region throughout the state, Midwest and at national conferences. Reading and speaking a variety of European languages, amongst them Italian, French, Russian, Spanish and German, and even some Biblical Greek, Amado is widely travelled in Western Europe, from the British Isles and the Netherlands to Southern Italy, Greece and of course Sicily, where his original roots are. At least that's what he will explain in the interview. All right, that's um, it as far as introduction. Let's get right to the uh, interview. Good morning, Joseph Amato. How are you? I'm fine today. Good, good, good. We just had a pre-chat um, before actually hitting record, and uh, you told me that it is morning where you are. You just read the newspaper, the morning newspaper, uh, reciting some of the news that was in there for today. And by the way, recording date uh, is if you're listening in the future to this uh, to this episode, this podcast is January twelfth, two thousand and seventeen. So we haven't actually established um, how I should address you, Mr. Amato. How would you like to be addressed? Uh, having reached almost 80, I've been called <laughs> each decade a different thing. But mm -hmm. uh, Joe Amato is fine. Or in our case, Joe is perfectly, uh, you're perfectly welcome to call me Joe. All right. Perfect. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate I'm that. not a hair professor, doctor, professor. Uh, no, no, okay. <laughs> Which would be the German equivalent if you uh, yes, of, if you would be Joel. in Germany? Yes. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. um, having said that, you are in your morning, and I am in my uh, well in my afternoon where I am. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about who you are, where you are at this moment, and um, what's your cultural frame of reference. And I know that's very broad. Yeah, that last part is quite immense, but uh, <laughs> I could talk for a long time. But I'm. Right now, living in uh, a western suburb of the Twin Cities, and that's Minneapolis and St. Paul. The suburb has a wonderful Indian name, uh, Powerful Waters. It's called Minnetonka. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it's somewhat in the triangle, uh, excuse me, the angle. Yeah, the triangle is all right. Uh, between the Minnesota that is descending... Uh, from north to south, and uh, the, the Mississippi River that's descending mm -hmm. north directly south, right. and and then that middle uh, watershed there. Mm -hmm. uh, we live in probably a suburb that would be now even typical of Europe. It's typical of many places in America. We have all sorts of stores and banks around us. Uh -huh. I, I live in a high rise. Mm -hmm. uh, we're on the eighth floor, so I can I can look west, and that's where my wife and I lived for forty years and raised our four children. Right. And that's out onto the prairie where things begin to rise up, mm -hmm. and uh, the villages are sizes of two hundred, eight hundred. It's where uh, the watershed can flow north to the Red River and then up to Hudson Bay, or it can flow slightly west to the Missouri River or flow over to the Minnesota that's coming towards the Twin Cities I described, or it can go fairly due south into the state of Iowa. Uh -huh. Minnesota is bounded. I don't know what who the audience knows, but Minnesota is bounded on its east by Wisconsin, okay. on its south by Iowa, and on its west by both North and South Dakota. Where I lived out there was a transitional zone. 
Uh And maybe I could use that to talk about cultural frames of reference. Yes, please. Uh, I was brought up in Detroit, Michigan. I was brought up in what might be called an industrial family, uh, largely of ethnic people, only in the United States. Uh, My grandparents just arrived from Sicily uh, at the beginning of the century. My other parents, our grandparents, are a wonderful mix of German, Irish, and if uh, people use the word, they were also on my mother's mother's side, Acadian. Uh And Acadian are the people who were deported in 1755 uh, from Acadia in Canada and dispersed Hmm. across the United States. Some returned to France and England, and it was the first great migration conducted by the British, but carried out by the Americans. Uh, At that time, there wasn't the United States, but Uh it was the colony, Massachusetts, that furnished it. So on one hand, I've always thought, uh, I'm now moving towards a cultural frame. Mm -hmm. By upbringing, I identified very quickly with peasants and rural people, even though I was living in the great industrial foundry of the United States. And as I was brought up, my youth was brought up with uncles fighting in World War II and the various European theaters, or I was brought up by grandfather or an occasional uncle working in a machine shop or industrial shop. Mm, okay. Uh, we had uh, a lot of Belgian Americans there. Uh, that I throw that in just because I'm assuming that might be of particular interest. Uh, a lot had come early and worked in tool and die work or mechanical work, and uh-huh. uh, and they also had the distinguishing trait usually of having colored homes. They painted their houses more colorfully than the rest of us, uh-huh. and. Every so often, pigeons flew over their houses, and that's how you could always say, ah, there's a garden, there's a pigeon coop, and there's right. a bright house. That's where a Belgian lives. I mean, right. that, but when they, they ran funeral homes. They ran hardware stores, or the British would say iron mongeries. They uh, uh, quite productive and quite successful, owned car dealers and so on. So we lived adjacent to Polish-Americans, uh, lots of Germans, occasionally Canadians across the border. So uh, I was used to, a, one might say, in the old language, a multi-ethnic or mm-hmm. multicultural thing. I was not a very good student. Mm-hmm. Carried golf clubs at the most expensive course, maybe in America. Mm-hmm. It was the country club of Detroit. I carried golf bags for Henry Ford, the grandson. Mm-hmm. I Sarah Firestone. So from the time I was 11 till I was 18, Mm -hmm. I knew high culture, at least country culture, like the back of my hand. I heard their gossip. I carried their golf bags, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You got that. I mean, how much does a boy or a servant learn in (laughs) in Downton Abbey? I learned quite a bit. The people in the basement aren't quite oblivious to what's going on upstairs. So I learned that. And then uh, uh, I got a scholarship. Uh, uh, It was a wonderful scholarship. They paid for my room and tuition. I went to a great university. Uh And uh, I promptly managed to raise the highest questions of high culture, even though I was barely educated. I was interested in what is time, Mm -hmm. what are the varieties of time. I lost God only to re-find him in kind of a conversion. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, opened up all kinds of areas about God and history or his spirit alive in history or can a soul find itself in the maze or the labyrinth of... Time. Because that that is eventually where you put your studies in, right? I mean, because it's um, if it's okay with you, I'm I'm fast forwarding forwarding. No, sl- please go ahead. Slightly. You're the boss. It's a, <laughs> uh, possibly well, not really. It's a, an interview we do together here. So you are you're an historian. Um, uh, so you've you've taught history and you studied history, evidently. So when is when was the first time you actually went out of the United States and you came to Europe? Because you have a specific inter- interest in German 
Italy, um, French histories, etc. So when did that happen and how, how was that for you? Well, uh, that was fine. Uh, the first place I traveled uh, out of the United States was I traveled for a month in Mexico and lived in Mexico City, traveled out into the Mexican countryside. I'd studied Spanish mm -hmm. and uh, wasn't real great, but had managed to fall in love with bullfighting and yeah. Uh, yeah. and uh, read my Hemingway and absorbed, you might say, a little of the uh, culture there. Yeah. The first time I left the U.S. for any lengthy, lengthy period is... Um, I, I was teaching high school mm -hmm. for the first two years out of university, and I wanted to continue my studies, and the draft board said, if you're going to continue your studies, you can have an exemption, but if not, and you don't, you're going to be drafted. And mm -hmm. I wasn't very keen on the war. I thought mm -hmm. the Vietnam War, even though I wasn't a political or diplomatic thinker, I thought they were a waste and that they mm -hmm. were going to waste the presidency and they were going to waste the nation in, mm -hmm. in, a, in a futile thing. And I think I ended up right on that. That was just a kid's guess, a yeah. child's yeah. intuition. But I went to Canada instead. I really wanted to study theology, uh -huh. and I wanted to go, for some crazy reason, to Levain. I I'd been reading some theology, and I thought, boy, that's where I'll go and catch up. But I couldn't go there because I couldn't get a master's degree, which was a higher degree. So I went to French Canada, where I studied for 15 months in French, mm -hmm. lived in a French house, and was in the city of Quebec. When, que when Quebec was quite agitated at that moment, the famous visit of Charles de Gaulle, Quebec Libre. And, uh, <laughs> after, after that, uh, I'd written a dissertation, yeah. to my surprise, but again on time, I'm the greatest reactionary and most maybe intelligent reactionary. I didn't say conservative. I said reactionary. Joseph de Maester, who was reacting to the French Revolution mm -hmm. with a particular virulence, having lost his place in Savoy and having gone as ambassador to Ma Moscow. Mm -hmm. So that committed me, you might say, to France. Uh, and then later I did my doctoral dissertation, as I said earlier, on Mounier and Maritain. I, I think I got quite good at understanding uh, 19th and 20th century French thought. Mm -hmm. And I also, I think that my thesis was basically, as brilliant as the thinking is, it really can't face up to the pace of events. Mm. Events outrun thought. Mm. So people can think a great deal, but events outrun them. And that comes from a notable upper-class American patrician, uh, Henry Adams, mm. whose education of a whose education, quote, of Henry Adams, mm -hmm. is, uh, was a formative, another formative work for me. I, I, when I was young, I moved by formative works. Ortega Gazette, The Spaniard, uh, I fell in love with as an undergraduate. Mm -hmm. I knew my uno muno. And, of course, my teachers were often, uh, particularly one, were German, German-trained, German-educated, and wrote on the diverse British topics or European topics. And this was all, this was still in the United States, right? That, that study, yeah, I referred to the training yeah. was, uh, was at the University of Michigan, yes. Okay. But, but German culture, as far as the Europeans go, and history was paramount. We've not had that next wave uh, which comes in the 70s in the U.S., where more and more, aside from just going into sociology and a variety of topics mm -hmm. that the Germans didn't control, the the next great range was French, French, French intellectual history, or more precise, the post-structuralists, mm -hmm. uh, Derrida and company, and all that. And I didn't go for any of that particularly. That was a little too technical for my thinking. And then the last thing that brought me to the U.S., I mean, I traveled to England several times. I played go golf all across Scotland and Ireland. I'm an ardent golfer. That came from those caddy house days. Uh -huh. uh, 
I had to discover my own roots, which are buried in the mountains. Of Italy? Of, yeah, above Palermo. Uh-huh. And uh, I first went, have you heard of, or I hope your audience may have, Danilo Dolce? Mm-hmm. Danilo Dolce almost won a Nobel Prize. He was a social reformer in Italy, and I went and visited him, got to know his work, hosted him in the U.S., and that was my first tie to Sicily. But then my second became finding my own family and background to tie up my interest in the Italian mezzogiorno. I I'd studied with a very fine American uh, historian A. W. Salamone, who mm-hmm. took me to Croce and uh, De Ruggiero, and 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 a lot of the Italian intellects, who of course were fed the uh, by Germans themselves. Mm-hmm. So there again, the Germans were crossing back into my education. So yeah. okay, I talked. I talked. To, I threw out a lot of different stuff, and I should mention one last thing, Chris. I also developed a passion for Russian dark literature when I was at the dark, university. You say dark literature. And Dostoevsky is the simplest way. Okay, <laughs> yes. Uh, Chekhov would be the other side. In other words, the irrational, the the bizarre, the probing, and uh, that got me not uh, to studying Russian. So I went quite far in the study of Russian, too. I had uh, three years of it at the university. I could uh-huh. read it fairly well, and uh-huh. even in graduate school, I took some work in Russian history as well. Would you say, uh, then, uh, the the two writers you've mentioned right now, would you would you link that? I mean, I my I'm trying to I'm stumbling over my words here. Um, I've been a couple of times to Russia as well, and I can very much associate what you said, like dark, the the darkness, not only in terms of weather-wise, but somehow, is that some, it seems like a dark country in a way, um, I mean, not literally. Is, do you think that's that was then, and, this, and that's still the case now? Um, I, well, I think they've not found their way into the Enlightenment, um, uh-huh. <laughs> into the 18th century, yeah. uh, successfully. They somewhat jumped the Enlightenment for Romanticism, yeah. and then the Romanticism they chose was, a, uh, in my opinion, a, a sweeping Romanticism of either total collectivisms yeah. or brooding individual souls, uh, uh, extreme, uh, extre- Rousseau really lost in profound kind uh-huh. of uh, Romanticism. And uh, I think you can see all of that worked out in the novels of Dostoevsky, which form a, an evolution from his days in the prison in Siberia mm-hmm. uh, to uh, each novel becomes a progression of his exploration of the Russian tradition. But the answer to you is Russia never found its way into a civil constitutional system. And their attempts just before World War One aborted mm-hmm. uh, with their was it three Dumas I believe mm-hmm. and uh, uh, and then came World War One a great great tragedy and then needless to say the twenties and thirties another mm-hmm. tragedy Russia never consolidated a civic tradition meaning how we live together by the law how we amend the law and how we somehow or other tolerate one another or love one another <laughs> in, mm-hmm. in, a, in a social contract. I, I don't think they ever established a social contract. It's, it's uh, yeah, well, not in the way that we have, at least, not in, in the, or the way we have in terms of the Western world, that is. You, you are you are an author of an enormous amount of books, uh, a, a plethora of books almost, um, and one of them that I've written that down, because, because the titles are, are uh, triggering as well, Victims and Values, History uh, and Theory of Suffering. Is that something, what, what's that book about? Do you cover different countries there? And, and has, uh, has, well, has uh, suffering uh, uh, evolved it, over the years? Well, the language or the rhetoric of suffering is one of the primary instruments of uh, counterpoint in political rhetoric. Uh, let me, can I say three, four sentences yeah, on this? Go, please, go ahead. Uh, 
the earlier book, Guilt and Gratitude, being two defining modes of the modern mind. We're guilty we're not all we can be. That sounds like Hillary Clinton, but everyone should be (laughs) all they can be, and we're guilty for it. Or we have gratitude for all our soldiers who went off and fought a war. I'm I'm, 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 I'm mocking it a little bit, but Mm -hmm. I set up two extremes. But we do... At the fundamental uh, human relations, at everyday life, at the heart of culture, you give something and I give you back something. That forms an exchange, okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. At a little higher level, a little more testing level, and Marcel Moss, the French anthropologist, uh, old and established but a classic, is a guide here, although I don't think he's entirely correct. The Mm -hmm. second level which I would stress more, or is even gifts. I'm given something, and because I'm given it, I can never repay it. Uh, I'm always in debt to it. Even No matter how much I give in return, I can never equal that first gift, like a mother's love, God's creation, mm-hmm. a friend who... Now, one of the primary things we both exchange and give one another is suffering. Mm-hmm. Uh, the biggest gift might be, I lay down my life for you. As Christians, that's emphatic, but it's emphatic as Jews. It's emphatic in all cultures to give one's life for someone else. And that is a powerful gift. And so you end up with a discourse, I'm great because I've taken or I'm making power, Donald Trump, maybe. (laughs) I'm great... (laughs) because I've given so much, I exchanged so much, but then the other one is I have values or I have authenticity because I've suffered for something. Hmm. Uh, I've suffered for it. And we exchange those in history. history. Uh, And you could go through the Middle Ages and see what they did with suffering, Mm -hmm. what they did with penance, what they did with the religious mass as a form of sacrifice. And then all of a sudden you get to modern history, very mm-hmm. modern history. Which starts when? Where you can, uh, that, in the Romantic period, I'm jumped, I've jumped all the way up into the early 19th century, okay. where pe- people begin to have to suffer for the truth. The Russians like that rhetoric. Uh-huh. Uh, our truth is what we're suffering for. Truth and suffering, or what we've endured makes suffering and and so we begin to play those off against one another. And if you wish just to jump ahead, mm-hmm. the language often that war veterans play against civil society is we went out and we suffered. Of course, we maybe killed some people, but we suffered for you mm-hmm. back home. So you exist on our suffering. Mm-hmm. Now, if you push that right up to today... Mm-hmm. Uh, so much of modern political discourse of the victims and the people who claim they're culturally diverse. I don't mean people who are culturally diverse. I mean the the people who build an ideology and rhetoric around it, Uh build up a language that they are, you are indebted to them because they they suffered Mm -hmm. for your benefit or you exploited them while you got ahead. Yeah. And a lot of that runs through modern discourse. If you read Marxism mm-hmm. in a very theoretical way, the capitalist steals not just the labor uh, of his workers, mm-hmm. he steals their very being. He empties the Aufheben, I think is the German word. Mm-hmm. He empties them out and takes everything. So his buildings are constructions on the tears and wasted lives of the workers. Now, I'm not espousing that. Please understand. I'm just trying to explain at the depth how that language works. As a result, especially I think this is true of Europe, who Mm -hmm. has what I often call suitcase socialists, Mm -hmm. uh, those who in the third or fourth generation want to identify with suffering and make it a rhetoric Mm-hmm. frequently, if they acknowledge it's not them, they, they say, well, it was my family or the people I represent. 
I represent suffering in the battle of values. Mm. And that, I think, is a very profound discourse. And I wanted in that book Mm -hmm. just to show how important gifts are, gifts and exchange are in history, but more importantly, how we use and redefine suffering to claim benefits or claim uh, individual stature Mm -hmm. or stature, collective Mm -hmm. stature. So anyhow, I'm sorry to go on so much about that, but that was a, an important book for me. Okay. I'm, I'm going to read out a couple of titles here, and I'm going to uh, let you pick a title okay. uh, to maybe somewhat elaborate on this one. Um, first one on my list here, and this is just a selection from what I um, I got from, I think the source, no, I know the source was your Wikipedia uh, page that you have. You have quite a number of books there. So the first one is Guilt and Gratitude, A History of the Origins of Modern con- Conscience. Yeah, um, origin. Yeah, well, that dealt with this exchange between who gives right. and who doesn't give in society. Okay. And, uh, and it dealt more, Chris, with what we feel we owe the past. Uh, do you feel, and I'm, I'm, that's not personal to you, but yeah, just yeah. speaking to the audience, do you feel indebted to the tradition you've been given? Do you feel indebted to the veterans who served in Belgium in World War One, uh-huh. or in World War Two, or wherever you are? What is your rate of indebtedness to the world around you? Uh-huh. Is that a primary move of your conscience, or yeah. is it more you feel indebted to what you should make for your children? It's right. almost a discourse between obligation to the past or obligation to the future. Right, yeah. And yeah. and that, of course, I think you, you, you can hear right away, that is a cultural divide that runs through modern politics mm-hmm. and discussions of progress. I think it, in some crazy way, was just mirrored in the American election, where well, where Trump was all over the map saying anything that came to his mouth. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, the uh, Hillary kept arguing, we're going to be more and build a society in which we're, we're going to have somewhat perfection or fulfillment and you had others saying no 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 what about remembering (laughs) us or remembering our village our place on the farm or the past okay i'm sorry that's so that's guilt and gratitude (laughs) okay fair enough then you have a very interesting title uh the great jerusalem artichoke circus and the next one on my list is the book of twos the power of contrasts polarities and contradiction and then your last or your latest book, rather, is that was published in 2016, Everyday Life, How the Ordinary Became Extraordinary. That book actually triggered me to get in touch with you. What What is that book about? Well, boy, that that's a complicated thing. I just got through giving an hour talk on it, and okay. I've got to do it in about a minute for you. But uh, well, here, uh, the basic notion that I use. It's a very rough measure, yeah. but I use the village. So I'm back to the point I made about the village. I have to use a point of contrast if I'm an historian to know how much things have changed. Mm-hmm. That's, that's the historian's burden. He measures change and tries to pick out the significant changes, those that are irreversible and cause great Influence that yeah. comes, by the way, from the British historian Collingwood. That specific formulation I just gave. Okay. Um, but the thesis is, for me, that most of the people lived in villages. Now, taking characteristics of villages, limited, very limited number of people, and this is worldwide, right? Worldwide, Close it applies, worldwide. I think, particularly to Europe, to up to about 1,200, 1,250, or 1,300, right. when uh, outside markets begin to really penetrate Europe. Uh-huh. Outside markets, meaning distant cities, uh, or it could be as far away as the Near East, but uh, the world is basically in a village. It's relatively autonomous. Uh-huh. There's not tax collectors all over, public officials, yep. or uh, uh, 
the language is not written. It's not coming in by newspapers or proclamations or even coming in by paste on bulletin boards. Uh-huh. It's just there. Yeah. So culture is oral. It's in a small group. It's in limits. Mm-hmm. There are travel, no doubt. People go on pilgrimages or they lose their place on the land, which is the great tragedy, as they say in Italian, chi non ha non è. He who hasn't isn't. Chi mm-hmm. non ha non è. <laughs> and all of that keeps people in somewhat a repeating, fixed world. And if I were going to define the ordinary, it's what is common, what is daily, what is repeating, Mm -hmm. what occurs over and over again. It's what we say, how we meet people, how we react. And it creates, in great part, a culture that has a pathway, tracks, and those tracks circle. Yeah. And the timing, even the clock isn't present then. Uh-huh. The clock is the seasons. Are the fields ready? Uh, the, and you know, I'm, I'm sure you're sensitive to that if you're living in the Netherlands, how a certain number of people live by the productivity of the fields. Mm-hmm. And that is ordinary. But things get extraordinary when strangers start to show up they always spell change Mm -hmm. they either to make the old joke they either take your wives or steal what little money you have (laughs) or take away your sons for the army or something Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. when strangers show up villages change if if they show up a lot Mm -hmm. and you can't get their message under control or bring it back into your rhythm of your life. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so markets cause great change. The central state causes great change. Democracy causes great change. Mass industry, of course, commercial culture and mass production cause great change. Mm -hmm. And, to make maybe the simplest point, mm-hmm. work goes out of the village. Yeah. So I have, I have, uh, if you allow me, I have two more questions for you. Um, the one is usually could be the toughest, which is, can you give us and the audience three tips to become more culturally competent? Well, yeah, I guess I'm going to make this up. Three is quick, but one is. Try to understand folklore and the place of Proverbs Uh in human experience. Understand how villages work and what was their way they described themselves or they talked about themselves or they gave prescriptions. Uh Understand villages. Second, study, study a family. Could be your own but over three generations of migration. Mm -hmm. Study them, see how their housing has changed, how their markets have changed, how their environments have changed. Learn, learn something in detail. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. Learn some. So you're going to learn about villagers. You're going to learn something in detail. And then just for fun, (laughs) <laughs> Just yeah. for fun, the third one, uh-huh. read and study T.S. Eliot's poem, J. J. Alfred Proof, Proofrock. Okay, can you repeat, repeat that again, please? The third one is, and it's partially for fun, Yeah. but you can find the, our cultures and our change going on in modern contemporary poetry. Yeah. At the beginning of contemporary poetry, there's a wonderful poem by T.S. Eliot. It's a, in in terms of book length pages, it's about three pages. Yeah. Called the love song of T.F. Uh, J.L. Uh, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. It's a great poem to discuss the mixture of cultures that run around in our modern mind. Mm-hmm. And cultures have become so mixed and so varied, 
And they're so much a part of individual dreams, or to use the old writer's phrase, having a bedroom of your own, Mm -hmm. that the world is not easily pinned down. And even when you go to think of your own everyday, ordinary life, it turns out not to be so everyday, (laughs) not Mm -hmm. to be so ordinary. It's very profound, a very poetic um, ending to this um, to this podcast, um, Joe. If people want to get in touch with you, how can they do that? Oh, well, I don't know why they would want to, but uh, you, you, well, I don't know. You know, the best thing would be. Uh, I think that my son might have established something on my website, mm-hmm. which people might want to look at. Joseph A Amato dot yes. com. But if they do want to contact me. Uh, they could uh, just use my email address, which is uh, a motto, A-M-A-T-O, J-C, letters J-C, uh-huh. at gmail.com. And write me a short note, uh-huh. and I'll be glad to chat a little bit, but I won't read whole manuscripts for people. <laughs> I have a hard time reading my own. <laughs> and, Fair enough. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I just can't become someone's uh, 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 copy editor. I'm not no, much good worry. at that anyhow. You won't but, be doing uh, it. Uh, and uh, they could do that. They might, if they don't like all this long-winded history talk, they could try my most recent volume of uh, My Three Sicilies, uh-huh. which is a set of poems, an essay on my family, and four short stories I made up. Mm-hmm. Or if they somewhat liked my philosophic approach and they wanted one summary volume, if they could get their hand on the book of twos, uh, I, I try in a certain way to to deal with the summary of uh, of my thinking. Uh, it's not done yet. I've still got about four more books I want to write, and then I'll see if I'm uh, I've explored what one lifetime can explore for me anyhow. <laughs> Excellent. It's been a really rich interview, Joe. Thank you so much for taking well, the time. Well, thank you. It was a fun talking to you. You gave me a lot of, uh, you might say in baseball terms, you pitched a, ball, a lot of balls right over the plate. So there were no <laughs> <laughs> no screwballs or curveballs or difficult balls to hit. No. They were all there. Thank you. My pleasure. And um, uh, everything will be in the show notes that you can find on culturematters.com. And um, I will let you know, Joe, when this uh, when this interview goes live, so you can uh, have a listen to your own talk. How about that? Oh, I'd love that. Yeah, if you'd send me a link, and then um, it's nice. Maybe I can put it on my website or something. It was a, it was a lot of fun talking with you. I rarely get a chance, okay. or do I rarely get an opportunity to speak on so many things I've written. That was really quite a, quite a quite a nice uh, opportunity. Appreciate it. All right. All my pleasure. Now on to your next cup of coffee, I guess. All right. Thank okay. you. Thank you then. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you again, Joe, for taking the time and being very elaborate. Um, also, well, my apologize to the listeners, that is, is because it's uh, for technical reasons it wasn't possible to establish a Skype connection. And hence, we use the old, good old telephone. But talking about history and then using a good old telephone isn't uh, that far apart, I guess. All right, that's the end of number 72. I'll be back in two weeks' time with another interview. And that's going to be a nice one as well. You take care of yourself. It was good that you were here. Thank you for your time. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.